Hi everyone, my name is Liz Kirchhoff and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Thanks for joining us today for Native Plants Throughout the Seasons through, with Debbie Grote and Carol Rice. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters right now and then they will take it away. So Debbie Grote always considered herself a gardener, but didn't know much about native plants when she enlisted the help of the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee in 2005. As a member of WPPC's first mentoring class and with the help of an experienced native gardener mentor, she planted her first prairie garden. She has since expanded her plantings to several other areas of her yard. She does not consider herself an expert by any means, but is, con is constantly learning and is committed to native plants, not only for what they offer in terms of beauty and interest, but also what they offer to the birds, insects, and other creatures that visit her yard. Carol Rice has been actively involved with the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee since the late 1980s. She initiated the mentoring program in 2005. She's been involved with Chicago Living Corridor since its inception and is the current president. Uh, Debbie and Carol, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, we want to welcome everybody and we're going to take you on a little trip on uh, native, uh, native plants through the seasons. And uh, I'm going to try and advance a slide here. There we go. Okay, we wanted to show the progression of plants through the seasons in shade and sun in dry and moist habitats. That was a lot to cover and it meant that there were a number of favorite species that didn't get included. We have shown the plants in context, how the color combination changes through the seasons, how the plants look with other species blooming at the same time, and put some emphasis on the trees and shrubs that are features in our landscapes. We're sharing the perspective that you gain when the plants are growing on your own property. I have a five acre property and Debbie has a conventional suburban yard. We hope this will help you appreciate the beauty and value of our native landscapes, the value to birds, insects, and all wildlife. And in this slide, you see various uh, scenes through the seasons. You might uh, recognize some of those plants, but in the lower left-hand corner, some of you might wonder why we're showing you a picture of a fire. This is just a native prairie being burned, possibly in the fall, maybe in the spring, and uh, it sort of uh, replicates what would have happened in nature a long time ago when the prairies covered this part of Illinois, and the fire would have been caused more naturally by uh, lightning strikes, likely. So we're going to start with spring blooms that are mostly in the shade, and even though skunk cabbage isn't something that many of us would have encounter on our own property, we wanted to include it because it does launch the growing season for the coming year. Uh, skunk cabbage blooms very early. It can generate its own heat and sometimes comes up through snow. And uh, it's for that reason that we wanted to launch our, our talk with a, an image of the skunk cabbage. Bloodroot's a beautiful little white flower that appears very early in the spring. And then uh, what's left behind it are pretty green leaves that remain most of the spring and summer. Uh, it'll be one of the first ones that you see. And here's a little bit more of a close up of the flower. You can see how pretty it is. Yeah. The flower is very ephemeral. And here is Marsh Marigold. This, like the skunk cabbage, is very uh, associated with wet habitats. And for that reason, of course, uh, isn't as likely to be on your property, but it is a beautiful spring bloom and um, brings its bright yellow uh, flowers to brighten up uh, the, the spring flowers. Yeah, the landscape can be a little dull in the spring, but this yellow flower is beautiful. A twin leaf, the flower is very similar here to the blood root. Um, the, the ephemerals, the flowers will fade very quickly. Uh, the foliage will remain and you can see why the, um, the foliage refers, is referred to as twin leaf. Um, uh, one of the things about blood root and twin leaf is that the flowers appear before the foliage does. You've probably heard about Jack in the Pulpit. Maybe you've seen it. It grows in the woods usually. So if you have a nice shaded area in, on your property, you can grow Jack in the Pulpit. It will colonize. It will spread. So if you have one this year, you'll have several next year. Uh, you can see how the leaf comes over the top 
and that forms the pulpit in which the jack appears. And this spongy protrusion here is the jack, which becomes a tight cluster of green berries, which then in the um, fall becomes that cluster of red berries. And the birds love it, the mammals love it, some insects love it, great plant to have. And the sharp lobe topatica, this is sort of typical of the woodland wildflowers with the delicate coloration, the pastel flowers. This is another plant where the, foli the foliage appears after the flowers. These are on very short stems and you can see the very distinctive leaf that the sharp lobe hepatica has. Virginia bluebells is a very common spring uh, flower and you may be familiar with it already. It will spread, but not uh, excessively. It, it's in no danger of taking over your entire garden or yard. Um, and you can see it starts out as a little pink bud, which opens up into that blue flower. You have to be careful because this foliage will die back also. And if you want to plant something else in the area, you don't want to disturb this. So you have to make a note of where this is on your property. And a red bud tree, this is um, one of our early spring bloomers. And you can see the be beautiful blossoms that appear before the foliage does on the tree. And um, this is uh, the, the flowers that come out in the spring are very valuable to the early pollinators. Bellwort, uh, the distinctive uh, form of this flower is that the flower hangs down from the stem. Uh, it has sort of a twisted petal and um, the, the foliage and the whole plant, as a matter of fact, is attractive to deer. So if you have uh, bellwort or other pl uh, plants that we will point out later in the, in the presentation, you'll want to either create some protection or deterrence so that the deer don't eat them. And prairie trillium, actually the uh, prairie trillium is the red, it's, it, it usually grows in the shade so it may be a little bit of a misnomer. It's also called red trillium. The great white trillium is sort of symbolic of the woodland wildflowers. And um, there's the, the trillium, it's three, three petals, three leaves. The flowers will turn pinkish as they fade and they are very attractive to the deer. The deer find the white trillium much more readily because they are easier to find when their deer are active feeding so the red trillium isn't as much of a target for the deer as the white trillium are. The, the wild blue flocks. So wild blue flocks, um, you can see how they look in a drift. And uh, this drift is combined with celandine poppy, which we will also have, uh, uh, we'll talk to you about later on in the presentation. Uh, wild blue flocks is, um, got five petals and opposite leaves. It's not the plant that you see growing on the roadside in the spring that is taller than phlox and it has four petals and alternate leaves. Uh, some people call it uh, wild phlox, but if you're seeing that pink or purple or white plant on the roadside, that's Dame's Rocket and it is, a, uh, is related to garlic mustard. So you don't wanna leave the Dame's Rocket Wild blue phlox is lovely. Uh, you can see how beautiful it looks here. And if you get lucky and have a slope, you can get the, the plant kind of uh, drifting down this slope. There's the celandine poppy we were talking about. There were some in the picture with the Virginia bluebells and then with the wild blue phlox also. This is a spreader. It's a poppy after all, and it will pop. So um, you will find it in places that you never planted it and uh, it will, uh, spread, but if you don't want it to go quite so far, you can control it. You could, I suppose, take the pods off if you wanted to, but that would be a, a real uh, labor intensive endeavor. Um, so this is a great uh, area, a great spreader under, a, under your trees. Um, it will, as I said, grow just about anywhere, but it really does like shade. And if you have a wet or a dry year like now, it'll need a little moisture throughout the season to maintain the nice green foliage. The service berry is one of those spring trees, uh, just like the red bud, a beautiful lacy white flower, which then produces the berries that you see there, uh, generally in June. And this plant is often called June berry, and it is loved by birds. The cedar waxwings especially love this plant. So it's a valuable asset. 
While ginger is uh, often used as a ground cover, it grows in a clump like that, but it'll spread, but not aggressively. And it does have a flower, a very tiny little, uh, sort of a brownish red flower under the, under the leaf. Uh, they're very hard to see, but uh, it's not used for, its, um, for the flower, for the purpose of uh, having a pretty flower. It's the foliage that you want. Uh, likes the shade and it grows low. It's only oh, less than probably 10 inches, I would say, tall. And the sedges, uh, sedges, uh, you probably heard about them, but maybe aren't as familiar. There are dozens and dozens of sedges that are native in Illinois. Here's a few that uh, have, work in different situations. On the right is your, uh, is the sedge that most people are familiar with is the pen sedge. The leaves get to be about a, a, a foot long, but the, the plant, uh, the, the, the leaves curl over as they get longer and they create these waves. So the plant doesn't have a very high profile, but it will cover the forest floor. Uh, it multiplies more vegetatively. It's hard to grow from seed. So you wanna start this from plugs and it doesn't inhibit the ability of other plants to grow up through it. The ivory sedge is, uh, I refer to it as the hedgehog. Uh, it, very fine foliage and the, the leaves are only about six inches long. And you would use this maybe in a rock garden or stepping stones or where you want something very fine textured to use with smaller profile plants. The, um, the burr sedge over on the left, on my property it's growing in a wet sunny place and is very distinctive for the seed head, which is that um, medieval mace-like looking um, sedge. It's very well known for the, uh, for the seed head. And on the right is one of the few species that isn't immediately native in the Chicagoland area, but is, uh, it works in the habitat and it's a very versatile landscape plant. The leaves are broader than most sedges and uh, you can see on this plant, it's ready to divide. You can use it around the base of a tree. You can use it as a border edge or interspersed in a garden. And if you're looking for a sedge that you could use to replace hosta with something native, this uh, plantain leaf sedge would be a candidate. Prairie smoke is another early bloomer. It's a small plant, maybe eight to 10 inches tall. Uh, and you want it on the edge of your garden. This is the first one in the in the prairie that we're talking about. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And it comes up as uh, the foliage is sort of fern like and the flower on that stem is that little pink reddish flower. But that will when it goes to uh, when it has spent its time and goes to set seed, it will look like this. And I think you can see why it's called prairie smoke. Solomon seal is um, a plant that you're going to have in the shade. Uh, in a forested area or wood, wooded area. Um, and you can see that in both types, they produce a white flower, but the one on the left is sort of a bell-like flower. And the one on the right, the false Solomon seal is a lacy protrusion at the end of the stem. But they both produce berries in the summer and then they turn into these pretty blue berries for the regular Solomon seal or the copper colored berries for the um, false Solomon seal. And those are loved by birds, uh, chipmunks, squirrels, insects, lots of uh, animals and creatures love it. Shooting star is another early bloomer. Um, I like how the leaves come straight up and aim straight toward the sky and then that tall uh, stem arises and the stars on the top are like shooting stars aiming down toward the ground. And uh, the last uh, couple of things are also deer favorites, so they yeah. would want protection. Yeah. Wild geranium is a very common plant, very easy to grow. Uh, it's generally a shade plant, but it will grow in some sun also. In my yard, it grows lots of different places. Uh, it's not quite, uh, it doesn't spread quite as much as the celandine poppies, but it does spread. And again, when we talk about these spreading, if they come up somewhere you don't want them, dig them up and give them to a neighbor. Promote the idea of using native plants. This has a, a rather small, um, not inconspicuous, but not an amazing looking flower, but it's great for the early bees and they love it. And mayapple, this is a very colonial plant. 
uh, sometimes referred to as the umbrella plant or umbrella leaf. Um, it spreads vegetatively. And if you see one all by itself, that's probably the beginning of a new colony. It does have a, a blossom that hangs down under the foliage and it turns into an apple and it's reputed to be edible when it's fully ripe. I don't recommend experimenting unless you have a lot of confidence. And that's another thing that many, many uh, native plants in some quantity might be toxic. So unless you know specifically that something is edible, you wanna research it before you try eating it. And speaking of research, we should probably say that don't just take our word for whatever you're hearing. Uh, if you're looking for a plant to add to your property, do some research, find out more about it. And we'll give you some references at the end, um, but especially pay attention to the fact that some of them might be poisonous or dangerous to have. And Jacob's Ladder, where, uh, where the flowers fade, the foliage will persist for quite a while. And so if you are doing a woodland wildflower where some of the ephemerals are going to disappear and leave blank spaces in your planting, you might want to inco incorporate Jacob's Ladder because it has a very nice foliage and it will help to fill in some of the spaces that are going to be left when the ephemerals fade. Columbine is a little bit taller growing plant than some of the ones we've been talking about. Maybe, maybe reaches up to three feet. Um, the flowers, this is the color of the true native columbine in this area. And the shape of it uh, uh, helps the um, hummingbirds. Anything that's trumpet shaped or bell shaped uh, or uh, in that general um, shape will attract hummingbirds because they love sticking their little tongues down in there to uh, get the nectar. Um, this one will grow in shade, but some sun also. Pretty versatile. Ferns um, grow in the shade and they like it wet, in, generally speaking. Um, there are many different kinds of ferns and we're not gonna go into all of them here, but the uh, ostrich fern, which you see down here, is probably one of the taller ones. It grows rather aggressively, uh, but a lot in the springtime, a lot of people like to pick the fiddleheads from the fern and cook them and eat them. I've never done it, but I know people who have. Now, one thing that I do want to mention is that we talked about moving the woodland plants if they come up where you don't want them. Uh, woodland plants don't have the very deep root structure that prairie plants do. Uh, their roots are more uh, in the top maybe foot or so of the soil, and they are much easier to move. Their whole growing strategy is different than prairie plants, so that's something to keep in mind. So now we're moving to late spring or early summer. And yes, most of the next photos are taken in the sun because these are plants that generally speaking like the sun, but we'll point out their uh, habitat, their preferred habitat. And the, uh, the spring blooming shrubs are very valuable to include in your habitat because the, the flowers provide for the early pollinators. The fruit provides for a food for birds in the later summer, and it, they are also protection and nesting sites for birds. So any any time you can, most everybody has room for a shrub or a tree. Golden Alexander is a plant that likes the sun, and it will grow probably two feet, maybe a little taller than that. Um, you might confuse it with, or at least think it looks like Queen Anne's Lace, like the yellow version of Queen Anne's Lace. They are not related. Uh, Queen Anne's Lace is not a native and you don't want that in your, in your uh, yard. But uh, Golden Alexander is a great plant. It's the host plant for the Eastern Black Swallowtail and a uh, nice addition of yellow in the late spring. Fox club penstemon, you can see here the tubular shape of the bloom. In the middle, you see what the plant looks like in seed. Not only does the seed turn dark, but the, the stems and the leaves, of course, also turn dark. But the, the stems on the penstemon have sort of a dark reddish hue. And here's a, a photograph that Debbie took at uh, Millennium Park. Um, one of the things I discovered with uh, the the prairie gardens that were seeded is that some, some of the species stayed well mixed in the planting and other species seem to gravitate to a certain area. And the foxglove pentamen in my gardens at least gravitated to a certain area. So I have quite a lot of foxglove pentamen all grouped together. 
the elderberry, this is another shrub, very valuable to include on your property. Um, it has the flowers in large clusters in the spring, maybe a little bit later than the viburnums and some of the other spring blooming shrubs. And you can see the, uh, the clusters of very small berries and very numerous. And um, the, the fruit is produced around August when uh, birds, there, I read a, an Audubon information sheet that said that there's over a hundred species of birds that utilize the fruit, fruit of elderberry. And um, there, you may have heard of elder wine or elderberry jam. So it, the berries are edible, but again, read any information you can find about how you have to prepare it. And you have to get to the berries before the birds do also. <laughs> Spiderwort grows in the sun and it is about two to three feet tall. Uh, the flower opens up in the morning when it's not quite so hot out and then closes up as the day goes on and the sun gets a little hotter. And then that flower will be done for and you can see that there are lots of other little buds here that will take over the next day and the next day and the next day. Uh, if you cut the stems, it, it will bleed purple. So you'll stain your fingers for a little while, but uh, not, not permanently. And the difference in the colors in the two photographs is just due to the uh, sun conditions, I think, when I took the pictures. And it's a, it's a nice plant to incorporate blue into your mixed planting. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's not hard to grow. No, and it will spread too, but not, not aggressively, not a problem. Goat's beard, uh, this is one of my favorites because I like anything that's white and shines in the darkness. So this is a great plant for shade. It looks like a shrub, but it isn't. It dies back totally to the ground in the fall, in the winter, and pops right back up in the spring. Uh, I love the different kinds of flower. It doesn't look like any of the flowers we've looked at so far. So it's, it does like some moisture though. So if you have it in a dry spot, you might have to give it a drink now and then. I, yeah, and one of the things I wanted to draw your attention to, there are a couple of asterisks. Uh, again, this is something from a little bit out of, we're a little bit out of range here in the Chicago area, but it works in the habitat. It provides for pollinators. It, you know, it's, it's a plant that is not just planted for its um, beauty in the landscape. You can tell that, uh, a big part of our focus here is to tell you about plants that uh, provide uh, sources, resources for the insects, especially. Well, butterfly weed, this is one of our milkweeds. Um, it's a species that a lot of people are attracted to for its orange color, but butterfly weed is pretty, uh, pretty fussy about where it will do well. It likes dry and especially well-drained uh, soil. Uh, one of the things you can see about this plant is that there is a color range in it in the native situation that you don't get if you're doing a, a native R or a cultivar. Um, I have quite a bit of the butterfly weed in one of my prairie gardens and the colors range all the way from golden yellow to a deep reddish orange. And um, if you don't have the right planting situation for it, Try one of the other milkweeds, especially the swamp or red rose milkweed. Uh, but if you have a dry, uh, a dry, well-drained area, butterfly weed is a huge favorite. And the host plant for the monarch butterfly. Correct. And here are what the pods of the milk of uh, the butterfly weed look like. Uh, I thought that this this is a photograph taken at somebody else's property, and I just love this sort of ethereal nature of the photograph. And they will pop open like any other pod and spread like, uh, you know, as the wind blows them around. Wild quinine. Um, this is uh, sort of an adaptation of the uh, composite family, the daisy or sunflower family. It doesn't have the same petal structure, but it is a member of the family. And one of the things about the quinine is that it blooms longer than a lot of the uh, uh, perennials do. So if you have it in a mixed plant planting with other colors, it's gonna to help to offset some of those other colors as a white background or contrast. The white wild indigo is a tall plant. This will grow up to four plus feet. Uh, it almost looks like a shrub. And in the winter, when the stems break off, they seem to, they, they look like a tumbleweed growing across my yard. Really interesting seed pods also. 
um, just a, a great addition to your prairie garden. And one that you should plant in a, a well-planned space because they have very deep roots and you don't want to try to move them once they get established. Right. The pale purple coneflower is probably the dominant plant in one of my prairie gardens, the first one. Um, it's, it does like a drier habitat than the, the, the other purple coneflower we're all familiar with. And one of the absolute wonderful characteristics about these coneflowers is that they are much loved, especially by goldfinches. And with the population I have of pale purple coneflower, once the seed heads go to seed, uh, you can approach the planting and it, the, the birds will just explode out of the garden. They, they just love those coneflower seeds. Uh, wild bergamot or bee balm is uh, about a three to four foot tall plant. Uh, it, this is the native one, so it's the lavender color. There are many other kinds and it grows, uh, it doesn't, it spreads a little bit, but not, not too aggressively and it grows uh, quite close together. So it's a little bit, um, it's affected a little bit by milky, uh, by, what do I wanna say, Pow powdery mildew, sorry. <laughs> powdery mildew. Um, I don't do anything about it. It doesn't seem to harm the plant. It'll come back fine, but the bees just love it. You can just walk among these plants and the bees will never even know you're there. They're so busy. They yeah. don't, they're not interested in humans at that point. One of the things about bee balm in particular and many other flowers is that they have uh, they have patterns on them that are not visible to human beings, but they are visible to insects that can see ultraviolet. And there are guidelines and, uh, uh, that show the, the highways to the, the nectar and the plant so that um, things that are in the mint family, like the bee balm, um, are, are very attractive to pollinators. Nutting wild onion is a nice, delicate little flower. Uh, it, it is definitely in the onion family. If you knew nothing about it, the minute you touched it or moved it, you would know that it was in the onion family because it smells just like onions. Uh, it's nodding, as you can see, when the, um, the bloom begins on the right, it comes up and arches over, and then it produces that little uh, lavender plant. Uh, on the right, they look a little more white. I think that's because they were, that they spread themselves into a shady area, but they don't seem to mind it. But generally they like a sunny area. A rattlesnake master. This is, um, I talked about the adaptation of uh, wild quinine. This is an adaptation of the carrot family plant. So that the, what looks like a seed head is just what you're gonna get from the flowers on rattlesnake master. It's, uh, it's we, we sometimes refer to it as a guy plant. It looks up. <laughs> it, it has a different form and you can see it how, how it stands out in its structure from the coneflowers and uh, Susan's in the background. I've had people ask me when it's going to bloom and I tell them that that's it. This is the bloom, but it's a nice uh, change. I'm sorry, you were supposed to talk about that one. <laughs> that's okay. We can, all, we can both talk about all of these yeah. forever. Purple coneflower, this is a, the, the close relative of the pale purple coneflower. It blooms a little bit later and it blooms in somewhat moister soil than the pale purple coneflower does. The things I mentioned about the pale purple and the fact that the finches love it. And it's so it's an attractive flower for the pollinators and it's a seed source for the birds. So really worthwhile having in your garden and you can see that there's a butterfly uh, nectaring on the plant in there. And this was just a, what I thought was a beautiful view that one of our, the members of our organization had, has on her property. And if you have the space and you wanted to plan for something like this, I just think this looks like an impressionist painting with the different cone flowers and bergamot. And this is false or early sunflower, very similar to the sunflower, but there are some technical structural differences, maybe a little bit earlier, but it's also very attractive to uh, pollinators and it's a, an aggressive spreader as you might be able to see from the photograph. Baneberry, this is a red and white baneberry. They both produce a white flower in the springtime or, or earlier summer. And uh, so the flower looks very similar on both plants. On the left, you can see the red cluster of berries that the red bane berry produces. 
And on the right, the white cluster of berries with the black dots uh, are, uh, the, I should say that this plant is poisonous, definitely. So don't, if you have small children who might be tempted by berries, this is not the plant for you. Um, but looking at the white berries, you can see why this plant is often called doll's eyes. Black cohosh is another one of those ones that I like because it's white in a dark setting. It grows in the shade uh, or in a savanna setting possibly. And it starts uh, blooming from the bottom up of that stalk with kind of a, oh, almost like a bottle brush effect. And uh, it makes sort of a can candelabra type um, bloom, which is uh, also uh, often referred to as fairy candles. Yeah, one of those white plumy things. <laughs> yeah, those white plumy things. Yeah. And here's a, a mixed planting of composites. These are all uh, composites that they have the, the, the disc and the ray flowers combined in what looks like a flower, the cone flowers of the yellow and the purple and the, uh, the wild quinine all planted together. And can you, I, I don't know if you can see the, the tiger swallowtail, but you might want to look for it. Yeah, he's, he's so busy. He has so many choices here. And uh, with so many different kinds of plants planted so close together, or you know, maybe they spread themselves that way, um, the bees and the butterflies don't have to go very far. They don't have to use up very much energy to get to another flower. Common milkweed, uh, you all know this plant, I'm sure, but sometimes we aren't really cognizant of how beautiful the bloom is and how good it smells. Unfortunately, it's usually so covered with bees that you can hardly get your nose up there to smell how good it, it, it smells. Um, it's obviously the host plant, a host plant for the monarch butterfly who lays its eggs underneath the leaves, usually underneath the leaves. And then um, it's a great nectaring plant also. And then you see the seed pod on the right. Every seed is attached to the little silky um, substance which then blows through the air and produces more milkweed for more monarchs. And there is a whole universe of other insects that are right. adapted to living on the, on the milkweed. So you might wanna be aware of that. Right, it's a host plant for the monarch, but it's a host plant for other insects also. But we're so um, aware these days of the monarch butterfly. So uh, if you wanna have those monarch caterpillars and those monarch butterflies, you need to have milkweed. So either plant milkweed or plant more milkweed. <laughs> That's my mantra. Speaking of which, swamp milkweed. If you don't like the big leaves or the look of the common milkweed, swamp milkweed is a great one. It does like it a little bit more wet, uh, but it's pretty hardy. The uh, leaves are much more narrow, but again, the monarch puts its uh, egg underneath the leaf and it smells beautiful. And we're gonna hope to have some video here. Uh, this is going to be in a second. Uh, a uh, hummingbird moth that, oh, well, we'll see. We're not well, gonna see the hummingbird <laughs> moth. You'll, you'll find one sometime. Um, and if um, one of the things that you should always consider including in your the wildflower garden or your uh, pollinator garden is the blazing stars. There are blazing stars that are adapted for drier habitats and for moisture habitats. Some of them are shorter, some of them are taller. And another way you can differentiate them is by looking at the way the blossoms are attached to the main stem. Some of the plants I have what they call a spike where there is no stem attaching the blossom to the main stem. And some of them do have a small stem attaching, but they are really desirable plants for uh, the the insects that are looking for nectar. And the next plant here is the meadow bat blazing star, which appears to, uh, to be one of the most favorite nectaring plants for the monarch butterfly and apparently for bumblebees as well. But you can see that there's a little stem uh, attaching the blossoms to the main stem here. And one of the things you can accomplish um, if you have the vision and the time and the the stick to itiveness. Uh, this is a field, a prairie field now, that used to be an agricultural field. I believe that it used to be alfalfa. And uh, Jim Keenan, who is a former president of WPPC, this is his property, and this is what he accomplished on that former agricultural field. A trumpet vine is one of the first vines we are talking about. 
Uh, it can be trained to run along a fence, or in this case, it's the railing on my deck, or you can make it go up and over. Uh, it's easy to do because it is so aggressive. It will grow everywhere. Um, this one was hard to establish. I had it in three different places in my yard before it took off here, and boy, did it take off. I swear sometimes I go out there and it's grown a foot overnight. Uh, it will come up in my yard, uh, but I just mow. When I mow it, you know, I cut it off. If it comes up in a garden area, I just pull it out. But it's a great one for the hummingbirds also because of the shape of the flower. Anything trumpet shaped is for the hummingbirds. Uh, this is the true hummingbird magnet in my yard. The flowers look, uh, they're small. They're really not all that uh, magnificent looking, but that color and uh, the shape of the flower are what attract the hummingbirds. And when you plant uh, several plants together, you get a, uh, just a great profusion of red flowers. And obviously the insects and the butterflies like them also. Yeah. And it's a, a little slow to establish, but once, yeah. once it gets started, you have really a nice um, target for pollinators and hummingbirds. The compass plant is one of a genus called sylphiums. They're all kind of distinctive for the leaves that they have. Compass plant has a deeply uh, lobed leaf. Uh, you can see it in that center photograph there. Um, other plants in the same genus are the um, prairie dock and the cup plant that are, and rosin weed are the other sylphiums. Um, it will be kind of slow to mature. It has very deep roots and uh, it generally is not going to blossom for about the first five years because it takes such a long time to develop. But when it does get to that maturity, it's going to shoot up that very tall blossom stalk. And even, the, even used by species that don't eat seeds or nectar because the um, the dragonflies and the birds that are hunting other insects can use it as a perch while they sit and wait for their their prey to come flying by but it's a very very popular the seeds are uh, and you can see the the comparative height of the plant in the the prairie planting that it's in uh, Joe pie weed, I hate the fact that the word weed is in there because a lot of people think of it only as a weed, but I guess if you thought that way, you would think that milkweed was just a weedy plant also. Uh, it grows very tall, probably, I have some that's eight feet tall, I would say, that's well established, it's been there for a long time. Uh, the Joe pie, there are a couple different kinds of Joe pie weed, and sometimes they like a little bit more moisture than other times. Um, because that pretty cluster of mauve colored flowers just becomes almost like the head of a dandelion when it goes to seed and they will blow all over the place and so you will have them spread. So again, if you don't want them where they end up, you can remove them, give them to a neighbor. But it's a great pollinator plant, especially for the tiger swallowtails. I hardly ever see a monarch or another kind of um, butterfly on those flowers, but the tiger swallowtails love them. And this is uh, for the, the people that might want some beautiful combinations and have a smaller property, we showed you a few photographs of things on larger properties. This is just a beautiful, almost like a painting on a smaller suburban lot with a royal catch fly, purple coneflower, and blazing star. Uh, if you have that vision in mind when you establish your plantings, this is something you can achieve. And we don't usually think of purple and red going together, but it's beautiful, really striking here. The lobelias, cardinal lobelia and great blue lobelia are a little bit taller plants. You see them sticking up above some of the other plants in the center picture. The cardinal flower especially likes wet feet and uh, another hummingbird magnet and um, all pollinators like both of those plants. So if you want a really true red or a true blue plant, these are great plants yeah. to add. And uh, cardinal lobelia is a little bit shorter lived. So if you want to have a continuous uh, supply of cardinal lobelia in, a, in an area, you might want to replenish the planting every few years. And I make sure I strip the seeds off every year and spread them around just to make sure I have more the next year. And there are many different sunflowers. We just have examples of a couple of them here. Um, we were offered the, this photograph on the left and the, the gal that provided it to us thought it was 
the sawtooth sun, sunflower, she wasn't 100% sure. The other photograph is the um, uh, Occidentalis, the Western sunflower. It's also sometimes referred to as the bare stem sunflower. Uh, they, they are pretty heavy seeders, so they are going to spread, but they are great for providing food for the birds. Obedient plant is a pretty purpley, yeah, uh, purpley pink flower late in the summer. It does also like a little bit of moisture. Uh, it's called obedient plant because they say that if you twist that flower, that group of flowers in a certain direction, aim them in a certain direction, it will stay that way. It will be obedient. Uh, I'm not so sure I've tried that. In the, I don't, I'm not sure it works every okay, time. Maybe just the individual floret, each yeah. one by itself is yeah. easier to do that with. Yeah, it will spread a little bit, but not aggressively. So it's a really nice, nice yeah. late summer plant to yeah. add. And also I believe uh, prefers moist yes. habitats. Yes, yeah. it likes a little moisture. And if you're trying to sort out the, the various Susans, uh, define uh, which one is which and so forth, the sweet black-eyed Susan and the brown-eyed Susan, first of all, they generally bloom later than the, uh, the, the, the straight black-eyed Susan that uh, will at least start blooming earlier in the season. But you can see the structure of the flowers is different. The sweet black-eyed Susan has more petals, has longer petals, and the brown-eyed Susan has shorter petals and it has maybe a more geometrically organized shape. It's also like, uh, it likes edge, edge situations that uh, I talked about plants that like to move around it after they're seeded. A brown-eyed Susan in our, one of our prairie gardens it totally encircled the whole planting after a couple of years. It had a perimeter of brown-eyed Susan and the sweet black-eyed Susan smells wonderful. Culver's root is another one of those white spiky things. Uh, this one, although it looks a little bit like black cohosh, it is, um, it likes the sun and will grow just about anywhere, but uh, the bees and other insects love this one also, but it's a nice addition among the other more sort of more traditionally shaped flowers. And here's another uh, wildflower painting picture. I believe the purple prairie clover, uh, that was one of the reasons we selected this photograph because we wanted you to see the purple prairie clover as something to uh, be able to get a good look at and plan on including in your planting. It is a legume in the pea family. That's a very good plant. And then we have the, the royal catch fly, which is the, um, the plant that Debbie's already talked about earlier. But these are some of the, the things that you could design if you're planting plugs. And there we are with the red and the purple again. Yeah, and this is a bone set. Bone set um, likes it moist. And one of the distinctive features of bone set of this particular species of bone set is that it has what they call a perfoliate leaf, the opposite leaves that you can see those very long leaves that pair uh, together at the center stem are actually joined around the stem. So it looks like the center stem is piercing one very long leaf in the middle, but it's the, uh, it's the pairing of the two leaves where they come together in the center. And it likes it moist and it's a great pollinator plant. A yellow cone flower is, uh, as opposed to the purple cone flowers we showed you earlier, uh, you can see how the, the petals uh, fall down or aim down. It's a, a taller growing cone flower. Uh, in my yard, I planted it in the sun and then the trees grew up around it. And now the plants are, uh, you can just see them aiming toward any kind of little bit of sunlight that they can find. They're a little desperate in my yard now, so they do like sun. And this is a top-down photograph of a slender mountain mint. Um, I regret that I didn't take a side view of the picture so of the plant so you could see what it looks like. But the uh, mountain mints are just pollinator magnets. That makes me wonder how I managed to catch this photograph without the pollinators in it. But again, in the mint family, uh, many of the mints are very good pollinator uh, species to include. Here's another one with the word weed in it, which is unfortunate. In fact, sneeze weed itself doesn't sound all that attractive. 
uh, but it is a nice tall yellow flower in the fall just before the asters and goldenrod bloom. And uh, yes, the bees love this plant, but it definitely likes it wet. So I have a planted by the street, which is not wet at all. So I know that if I plant something that likes wet feet and it's not in that kind of an area, I'm gonna to have to water it. Generally, most of these plants are very self-sufficient and don't require much attention in terms of watering, but I planted that on purpose because I liked it and I know that I have to water it and that's okay. And one of the things about the structure of the flower is that most flowers have petals where the wide part of the petal is attached to the center and then it tapers toward the end and sneeze weed, it's just the other way around. So it's almost like a whole circle of petals uh, that were cut toward the center. Mm -hmm. It's a very distinctive petal form. Yeah. And here it is with uh, ironweed, uh, ironweed with the sneeze weed. And again, look at the beautiful color combinations. Uh, ironweed is very popular with pollinators, butterflies in particular are attracted to it. And, um, and one of the things about ironweed that I, I happen to know of is one of the gals that we know in the group uh, does uh, dyeing with natural uh, dyes and ironweed is one of the plants that she uses for her natural dyes. And it loves wet feet also. That picture on the right with the sneezeweed and the ironweed was taken at the edge of a pond. So uh, if you have that in your yard and it's not near water, you will have to water that one. Turtle head is the same, it needs water. So I have the, those plants planted in one spot together so I don't have to drag my hose all over the yard. Uh, it is a little bit unusual looking and they say that the bloom looks like a turtle poking its head out of its shell. I have to really kind of squint and use my imagination, but to each well, his own. One of the things that I'd like to comment on now with native plants is that very often if you're doing conventional gardening out of a garden center, not necessarily with native plants, you're amending the, the growing situation to be able to uh, provide the needs of the, the, the flower and in native plant gardening, you want to choose the right flower for the growing situation. So it sort of turns the whole situation around. So if you, you want to analyze, if you have a dry habitat, you want to choose things that will grow in a dry habitat and vice versa. All right. So this is just an example of what you get in the autumn a lot, uh, a lot of goldenrods, different, many different kinds of goldenrods and many different kinds of asters. And you'll see along the edge, it's, uh, there's a, a grass growing, that's prairie drop seed, which is another beautiful grass. We haven't talked much about grasses. We talked a little bit about sedges. Um, this one is right by my mailbox. And I often think um, my mailman might be a little reluctant to reach out and open that mailbox and put the mail in when there's so many bees. I mean, it's just covered with bees. He's never been stung. I've never been stung there. Um, you could just walk right through there and the bees wouldn't bother you because they are busy with other things. And there are asters for so many different situations. One of the things that you might challenge yourself with is uh, if you had the room and the, the inclination, you might try um, planting a lot of different asters and continuing to be able to identify them. Um, there are asters for drier or moister habitats, asters for shadier places and sunnier places. But it's very important that you have asters and goldenrods for the late season pollinators and the migrating butterflies. And here's stiff goldenrod. Um, we showed you uh, drifts of uh, maybe uh, more more fall, uh, excuse me, more woodland things. This is closer to fall and this is a drift of one kind of goldenrod maybe you wouldn't normally think of. Uh, this is stiff goldenrod and I want to say about the goldenrods, it's not the goldenrods that are causing your hay fever. Right, <laughs> yeah. And this is aromatic aster. This is the latest blooming aster. Uh, that is not, that shape that you see is not the result of pruning or anything. This is the form that this aster takes, that it is a low growing mounded shape. And uh, I remember one year we wanted to be able to collect seeds from it. The plant was still blooming when the frost came and killed the plant. So we never got the seeds. Wow. 
gentians grow uh, somewhat low to the ground. They, the stem sort of grows horizontally and then, and then upward, uh, both with the blue and the, mostly with the blue gentian. Um, the only insect that can nectar from this is the bumblebee because it's the only one that, whose proboscis is strong enough to open up that flower. That looks like a bud that you might be waiting for it to open up, but that's it. That is the flower. That's what it does. So the bumblebee has to work hard, but he's the only one or she's the only one who can get down in there and uh, nectar from it and cover itself with pollen to create more, both with the uh, bottle gentian and the cream gentian. Cream gentian is a little bit more uh, more visible in my mixed prairie plantings than the, the bottle gentian. Um, it, it, is pretty successful species. And there are gentians that are biennials and gentians that are perennials. So it's it's very interesting group of plants to uh, get more familiar with. This is just a, a, a fall picture. Uh, at the very beginning, we showed you a service berry, a white lacy spring blooming tree. And here it is in the fall with the pretty orange flowers. And of course, then you have your maples and oaks and so on that uh, you know, you wanna add color to your landscape in all seasons. Maybe not so much color is available in winter, but uh, there are still valuable plants for the winter. And this one we labeled finch food because we've been telling you about the cone flowers and how the finches love them. Other birds like them also, but don't cut back all your plants in the fall. We tend to just, you know, once it's done blooming, we cut them off, but don't leave as many up as you can for the birds because they're gonna need them all winter and they love them and you'll, you'll like watching them. Oops, well, I, went yeah, yeah. I don't know if well, I'll go back, but. The little, the little blue, blue stem, stem. <laughs> on, we were showing little blue stem with its coppery uh, fall color. And again, yeah, little blue stem is um, sort of a bluish green when, when it's actively growing, but that's a good one to provide multiple season interest and it's a, a better profile than some of the tall grasses that you might find too big for your property. And if you wonder why we're not just going back to show it, we've had some technical difficulties today, so we're not taking any risks here. <laughs> this is a picture of Carol's property in the fall with her prairie gardens in the foreground uh, and then the beautiful trees. In the yeah, background. most of those trees are uh, red oaks that um, they, they were Buckthorn infested, and um, we had them cleared out, oh, maybe 15 years ago. And um, that, that's what we've got now. There's a fair amount of wild cherry in there, too, but that's, that's a red oak area. So, uh, as I said, don't cut down all your plants because you want to leave them up for winter interest and to provide food for the birds. So, and I just did it again. Yeah. Uh, we went past the Menarda. Menarda is a very valuable plant in the winter. And this is Carol's Prairie in the winter. And for a bird flying over that, I think they just look at it and go, oh my gosh, where do I start? Because there's so much food there. And you can see something else has uh, shown some interest in the plantings there too. And this is a young white oak. Uh, when white oaks are still young like this, they hold on to their leaves in the winter and then they lose them in the spring when the new set of leaves is coming up. And is that only in young oaks? I think it's a characteristic of young oaks. Uh, the, the research that I've been able to access so far indicates uh, it's, a young, it's a young white oak characteristic. Okay. Uh, you saw the prairie drop seed at the bottom of the fall foliage picture I showed you earlier of the asters and goldenrod. Um, this is a great valuable plant for the winter also because uh, animals, little animals need protection and they might be voles or my, mice or things like that that you, you don't want them in your house, but um, they need to find a place to live also. So this is a valuable plant. And this is a poor frost and you talked about uh, Actually, this is your turn. Oh, that's um, okay. It, you took the picture, so talk yeah. about it. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a foggy, um, dewy morning that you might have this far frost uh, collecting on plants outside, but it's going to disappear uh, after the, the sun rises. And so it's, a, it's an ephemeral condition. And it's nice to be able to capture it when, when it occurs. So get out there with your camera and take some pictures like Carol did. So some of the uh, plants that we've talked about are slightly out of range. 
And then we're gonna show you a few more that are definitely out of range, but they work well and people do plant them in this area. So you might wanna consider using them. The dwarf crested iris is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's only about six inches tall maximum. Um, it just comes up like a little bright jewel in the springtime. It doesn't bloom for very long, but um, it's a great addition. And it, it's, uh, you don't wanna uh, plant anything else on top of that by mistake or in, in among it. Um, it's already kind of hard enough for me to get the grasses out of there and so on, but I love this. Plant. Could you use that as a ground cover? Um, it probably doesn't spread fast enough yeah. or enough, yeah. Um, but yeah, it will oh, be beautiful like that. The uh, indigo um, is another, we showed you the white uh, indigo earlier, and this is just one that's a little bit out of range, very similar to the other indigo, but blue. And uh, Carol always points out that these are the ones where they're, once they're established, they're very hard to move. This one, I was very surprised to find that we were out of range on this. I think the, the, the concentration of its native range is more in Minnesota, but a fabulous, fabulous plant for pollinators. And you can, um, this is another plant that's in the mint family. It's not especially tall and it has that sort of licorice smell, but um, depending on your purpose with your planting, obviously if you're working in a remnant prairie, you want to stay faithful to the original species that were there. But if you're doing a planting in your home garden and you want to attract pollinators and birds, as long as these plants are not going to become invasive and they work in the habitat, they are here for you to consider. The red minarda uh, is a, a great plant to add. It blooms a little bit before the other minarda we showed you, which is the true native, the minarda fistulosa. But this one is commonly used in this area also. Uh, again, a great pollinator. You know, we keep going back to that, but it's so important to provide the food for the bees, especially. Uh, so this one grows about four feet tall maximum probably, yeah. but it's uh, just another bright spot among the green. And the trumpet honeysuckle, this is a, a vining plant and it blooms differently than many of your other uh, uh, forbs do. It grows, it blooms at the uh, end of the growing stem. And so once it has developed sufficiently to produce buds, that year, it's going to continue to bloom throughout the rest of the blooming season. And it's native somewhat further south, but with climate change and everything, uh, we don't know what, uh, what other species might be able to, to do things. This is obviously a great hummingbird plant. And I have it growing on uh, the railing of our back stairs. Um, it's, you know, it's worth a try if you are willing to uh, use species that are out of range. And Indian pink, uh, this, this is going to bloom in some shade. It looks like it's also growing in a little bit sunnier location, but it's, it doesn't look like it's in heavy shade. And it's going to be after the ephemerals and provide really a brighter color than you normally see in your woodland or savanna settings. And the information is that if you deadhead the plant, it will rebloom. Absolutely beautiful. The person who took the picture on the left uh, told me yesterday that she's, uh, she's called a couple different nurseries to see if she can find more plants because she likes it so much. And uh, it's not all that easy to find, I guess, but it's a great one. Uh, here's, a, here's about the only shrub or one of the only shrubs that uh, grows in shade, the oak leaf hydrangea. You can look at the leaf and see why it's called oak leaf and the bloom looks like that of the more uh, commonly known hydrangea plants, which you might already have. But the fall color of that leaf is just beautiful. So we have some helpful resources here and um, we, uh, you know, we use each other as resources, not just Carol and me, but people, other people in the WPPC. And, um, you know, you just do your homework before you choose a plant and find out all the features of it. And uh, then you, you're likely to have some success. One of the things that you might do is go to the website for Chicago Living Corridors. There are resources there. There's a resource information 
on pretty much all the member organizations that are part of Chicago Living Quarters. Uh, the, just vast, vast information available on the internet. You can also just Google the name of a plant and look mm -hmm. and see what you can find out about it. Uh, also on the Chicago Living Corridors website is a nice list of uh, plant sales. Uh, of course, the plant sales of different organizations maybe over the last couple of years have maybe taken place, maybe not because of COVID, but um, there's a, a nice list of different plant sales and then retail uh, nurseries also where you can sometimes find these native plants. And these are just our photo credits. Uh, we took a lot of them, but most of these people are members of our organization, the WPPC. And at the bottom, you see Prairie Moon Nursery, which is a real go-to for us. They have a great catalog and cultural guide. Uh, they're in Minnesota, so you could Google that also. And uh, it's it's really my Bible for all the information I want about a, certi uh, a, a certain plant. So. And this is contact information. If you want any uh, follow-up information, you can, my email is there, Chicago Living Quarters website and Facebook page. And you can also go to the newsletter page on Chicago Living Quarters website and sign up for the, the newsletter, which is mostly just announcements of the next webinar. Which is? October 28th, uh, Chris Benda, who has a very extensive CV. He's also referred to as the, I believe the Illinois botanist is- Botanizer. Botanizer, yes. Illinois botanizer. And he's, he's, he gets special commissions to do uh, in plant inventories, all, all, maybe not all over the world, but I know he's done it in Hawaii. And he's uh, spearheading a Southern Illinois version of the Plants of Concern, I believe, that was started at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, he is, is, speaks with knowledge about a wide range of botany um, subjects. And I happened to listen in on this butterfly host plants and asked him to do that for us. It's a great talk. We hope you'll, we hope you'll join us for it October 28th at 7 p.m. You can sign up on the library website or you can click that, that link that will take you right to the sign up page. And thank you so much for joining us for this talk. Yes, thank you.